Welcome to another author chat from the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. I'm Tom Henninger, and I'm here with Rocco Constantino, a baseball historian who uh, also is the uh, found co-founder and a writer for uh, Baseball Nine dot uh, Ball Nine dot com, excuse me. And he's also the director of athletics at Middlesex College in New Jersey. Welcome aboard. Glad we can have this chat today. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's it's a great topic, and it's a topic I definitely love talking about, especially with great baseball people like yourself. Well, good. I'm looking forward to it. It's a key issue in the game today, and uh, well, let's get rolling. Uh, mm -hmm. You've written a wonderful and fascinating book. It's based uh, beyond baseball's color barrier. It's available now at Rauman Littlefield. Definitely catch up with it. It's a wonderful read. I was just fascinated with many of the topics in it. It does document the history of uh, African Americans and the history of the game. Uh, this goes back more than a century at a time when there were some black players before there was a uh, unwritten gentleman's agreement to segregate the game, which lasted for decades. And uh, Rocco also delves into some of the changes, the, um, the, the attitude and events that sort of chipped away at the uh, absolute segregation of, of that era. And then he goes into a wonderful stretch where you learn about a number of generations of black players and what, they, what kind of impact they had on the game. So another key element, of course, is the, the significant drop off in the number of black players in the game today. And uh, Rocco, was, was this an inspiration for this project? What, what inspired you to write this? book uh that that was part of the inspiration of it uh, i the story of it is i'd written my first book through roman and, and littlefield it's called 50 moments that define major league baseball uh, and it did well they liked it uh that was in 2016 uh, and somewhere late 2018 uh, roman approached me and asked uh they said they really like a, a book about uh, african americans in major league baseball uh, so my first thought was to go with the, the trends, uh, the downward uh, percentage and participation that we've been seeing really over the past 25 years, um, and then kind of how get into how that, that could be turned around, uh, how participation could start to increase. Um, the more I started researching and reading, the book just kind of ended up morphing into an uh, exhaustive timeline. Uh, so like you mentioned, we start from the 1800s. Um, to create that picture of, you know, how was the color line drawn, you know, what efforts were made to erode it, uh, what was happening before the color line was drawn. I thought that was interesting, too. Um, and just try to do an all-encompassing history with, um, you know, the peak of the book and the conclusion um, being that participation uh, really over the past uh, 25 to 30 years. Um, so it was, like I said, all-encompassing, but that, that percentage of African-American population in baseball it was something that uh, that generated all of that. Well, it was remarkably thorough. And, uh, you know, to, you, no matter what element of this whole story you're interested in, you're going to get more than enough information. And, and one part that I'm really fascinating with was the barnstorming days. And I, I think it was a very eye opening time for American League and National League players to, you know, to discover what the level of play was in the Negro Leagues. And uh, um, what are your favorite stories or what did you find fascinating about that time of the game? Uh, I found fa really fascinating. It's always been been an interest of mine. The barnstorming days—that's where all those incredible stories come from, and uh, you know things that inspire a lot of the books, like only the ball was white, or you know the Bingo Long movie. Um, you know, and there were a couple couple levels to that. There was the one aspect of barnstorming where you know teams or or players, uh, famous players, would get teams together and they'd go around and play local white teams, basically. Um, to these small cities, uh, you know, semi-pro teams, not the best competition level, and, and uh, but you know, the guys who put on a show, and um, you know, they were they were welcomed in a lot of these small towns, um, and that that was always fascinating to me too. Is that these games, uh, the barnstorming games, where it was the African Americans against local players, were well attended. You know, white fans came out, black fans came out. Um, you know, different story in the South sometimes, but, you know, for the most part, treated pretty fairly. And then after the game, you know, they shook hands and waved and sometimes even ate dinner together. But then the African-American players had to go off to their own segregated hotels and, and restaurants and things like that. Um, so it was it was interesting to me how baseball would, you know, would be able to bring those two groups together 
And probably for that short amount of time, you know, we weren't there to hear if there were cat calls or, or things from the stands that were said. Uh, you assume that there were, but but for the most part, for that short time, you know, blacks and whites were able to come together in the early part of the, the 1900s for baseball. Um, and then the secondary aspect of that was the more serious barnstorming where it was, you know, Satchel Paige would get his team of all-stars together and they'd, they'd play against Dizzy Dean's teams and, and Babe Ruth's teams and, uh, you know, and real legitimate major league guys and beat them, uh, you know, and the general you know, belief is that, that the, the Negro league barnstorming teams won two thirds of those games. Um, and I think what I always found interesting too, in doing my research was that they were very open about it. They, you know, a lot of people almost disparagingly said, well, the games mean more to the Negro league guys than they do to the major leaguers. Um, and that was embraced, you know, in, in a lot of the research I did with the Negro league guys took that and said, yeah, that's absolutely true. We wanted to, we wanted to kick your butts. And, and, uh, and they did, uh, you know, and it was good competitive baseball and, and you can go throughout history and do that research where, you know, the guys like Dizzy Dean and all the, the famous barnstorming guys would say that they played the guys they played against the Negro league stars were as good as, as anybody they ever played against in major league baseball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the, the results still dispel some of the myths that were prevalent about the fact that the idea that they really weren't as talented and that, you know, that's mm -hmm. obviously a key development. So, yeah. you know, you also write about uh, the influential black newspaper, the Pittsburgh, Cour uh, Pittsburgh Courier, which in 1939 conducted a survey of uh, several major league teams uh, talking to players and managers about the talent level in the Negro Leagues. And uh, it did sort of reveal that players really weren't the impediment uh, in, in, in segregation. Uh, what did you find to be the highlights of that study and what do you take from it? What would you like to share about that? That, that was one of my most uh, that was one of my most favorite parts of the book was actually coming across that study because I wasn't familiar with it. Um, yeah, well, that wasn't a planned chapter in my book. It just in my research, I came across a study. It was done by Wendell Smith, who, who was a fantastic uh, sports writer and writer in general, African American uh, baseball historian. Uh, he would eventually go on to be one of the people who was really started pushing and recommending Jackie Robinson. Uh, but before that, you mentioned it was 1939, he surveyed every National League club, uh, every manager and most of the key players. Um, and again, Hall of Famers, um, All-Stars, you know, Pie Trainer, Gabby Hartnett, all these guys, and posed that question. Uh, just a couple simple questions to him. Uh, are the Negro League players good enough to play in Major League Baseball? And would you embrace them if they came into the sport? And it was outright unanimous. Um, every single player that was interviewed and questioned said, um, absolutely, they're good enough to play. And absolutely, we would take them on our team. Uh, the manager said the same thing, too. Um, their job is to manage. You know, whatever team the owners give them, they're going to manage. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, another aspect of that, too, was um, Wendell Smith asked them, you know, who were the best players? African-American players that they played against or that they'd seen play. And the list was so, uh, so diverse, you know, it wasn't just Satchel Paige and Buck Leonard, you know, it was, I mean, there was a, when you tabbed them all up, it was like 45 different players. Um, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just limited to those guys, the, the more famous names. Um, there were people, you know, legendary guys from Saul White, and Rube Foster, um, you know, Frank Grant and all the way on through. Um, so it, it's, let like me say, I, I, in that book, I tried to capture that. And in that, in that, um, that chapter, I tried to capture that too, that we weren't just talking about a very small group of players who were talented enough to be in, in major league baseball. You're talking about dozens of guys, um, uh, who were shut out of that opportunity who could have been all stars, um, you know, and, and, and right along with everybody. Well, looking at that era too, a common perception today is that Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who became commissioner after the Black Sox scandal, was an integral part of segregation and maybe was even the ringleader. But you do point out that that's a bit of an over, oversimplification. And how did you see his role with the owners as far as maintaining segregation? That was a tough topic for me to wrestle with um, because you, you, you're right. He's the commissioner. He's in charge. He's in always called the iron fisted commissioner, a guy who took on standard oil and, you know, no nonsense guy, but 
he, you know, he worked for the owners. Um, the owners brought him in and, you know, he, he, as much as you don't picture him as being a guy that would take crap from anybody, you know, it's, it's really the owners and, and it tied into that Pittsburgh courier survey. There was not one person who said, or not one player or manager who said, you know, pointed the finger at Kennesaw Landis. Um, they pointed it towards the owners. Um, every one of them, if the own, you know, it's the owners that's keeping them out. So, um, you know, for me, if you simplify it by saying judge Landis was the guy and he's the face of this, that kind of takes the owners off the hook, which, which they shouldn't be. Um, so it's a very complex thing. And it was tough for me to wrestle with. Cause like you said, you want to paint it in the right, right aspect. Um, what really gave me some motivation and helped me, you know, wrestle with this was, um, I met with Bob Kendrick and interviewed him, the head of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Flew out to Kansas City, and it was the most it was the most amazing experience of writing this book. Um, and I asked that to him, what you know, what you know, talk to me about the complexity of Judge Landis's role. Um, and he said the same type of thing. It, it was a complex situation. He was uh, friendly with Rube Foster. Um, you know, the, the founder of the Negro Leagues and, and the most powerful guy at that time. Um, they had a great relationship. Um, there's the, the business aspect of it, too. You know, Major League Baseball was making money uh, off of renting their stadiums to the Negro League teams. Um, there was the level of, um, you know, Rube Foster's looking out for his, his leagues, too. You know, so if integration of baseball integrated, that would basically be the end of the Negro Leagues, and people understood that. Um, so there's there's just so much to it, um, and also you know Judge Landis did have have a history uh, on the court of supporting African American um, you know uh, justice and civil rights you know way before the civil rights movement, but he was seen as a liberal justice in social matters. So it, it's a very complex situation. You still say the buck stops with him because he was the commissioner. You know you never know what says what's going on behind closed doors. But, you know, it's a very complex thing. You can't give the owners a pass by just pinning it on Judge Landis. I would pin it on him and the owners as a group if it was up to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob Kendrick's wonderful to talk to, isn't he? Just, uh, just you know, just fascinating guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you expertly cover the, you know, the significant integration stories in the late 40s. Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby, and the many other early pioneers in those first few years. Uh, but you raised one that completely escaped me, and that was the 1949 All Star Game. Please, please tell us about that. Yeah, that that's something that was really interesting to me. Um, you know, I just kind of came across it. Um, you know, just just in doing my general research. You look at the 47 All Star Game. Uh, you know, Jackie Robinson was really the only African American player who could have been in that game. Uh, but he played first base that whole year, and and Johnny Mize and Stan Musial were the two first basemen. So, you know, he, he didn't deserve to be an all-star in 1947. 48, though, he should have been in the all-star game as a second baseman. Um, whether he should have been voted in or, or as a substitute, he had clearly the best stats um, of any second baseman. He moved over to second base by then. Um, and what had happened was uh, Eddie Stanky was voted in, um, but he was injured. Uh, so Red Shandies took Eddie Stanky's spot. He was half injured, too. Even the day of the game, they didn't really know if he was going to play. So they went to three second basemen and they picked Bill Rigney, uh, who was having a subpar year. Uh, Jackie at the All-Star break was was right around 300. I mean, any stat you went to, he was having the best season of any second baseman. Uh, but he didn't even get, not only did he get not get voted, but, you know, he didn't get selected. Um, and they, like I said, they had three second basemen on that, on that roster. So... Um, when it came to 1949, the All-Star Game was in Ebbets Field. I'm sure that helped him. Uh, you know, he was well established. And um, you had that public acceptance, too, where, where he was voted in to the All-Star Game. You know, everybody, obviously, Brooklyn, you know, game was in Brooklyn, so people were going to vote for him there. But, you know, you still needed that national support. That was at the time where people were writing names in the newspapers, cutting it out and mailing it in. That's how they voted for the All-Star Game. So for, for Jackie Robinson to start, um, that showed to me public acceptance uh, of him as the elite second baseman in the National League. Um, you know, and then on top of that, Don Newcomb was named uh, during his rookie season as a pitcher. Um, Larry Doby was named as a reserve. 
Um, and he was having a good year, not a great year. Uh, you know, he was in the 270s, 280s in the outfield. But, um, you know, and Roy Campanella was named the backup catcher, too. So, you know, that kind of 1949 All-Star game was what I thought the first time where it was really nationally, publicly on, on a big stage saying like, hey, these guys are among the best in the league. Uh, you can't deny that now. Um, we have, you know, Jackie Robinson's the elite second baseman. And, you know, at, at that point, too, you know, not even half the league was integrated. Um, but yet we still have four all stars here. So, you know, I, I just thought that was always a really important and, and something that's not always mentioned uh, in the timeline. We well, talk about some of the teams not being integrated as we moved into the 50s. And I think for some of those teams, uh, you talk about the second wave of talent, uh, the Frank Robinsons and Veda Pinson and numerous others. And uh, there is a big mistake in not integrating with the second round and uh, the second wave. And uh, I mean, to me, a big case is the New York Yankees, who were in the midst of a dynasty. Uh, they didn't feel they needed talent. I don't think uh, the GM, George Weiss, was the most um, you know, open-minded or, uh, you know, enlightened person about racial integration. That was part of the issue too. And, uh, you know, the Yankees fell off in the mid sixties. They had no superstars and really kind of were not a factor for over a decade. And, and of course the other team is the Red Sox, the last team to integrate. And you can say at the last day of American league play from the late 1940, from late 1949 season, uh, to the stretch one in 67, the Red Sox never held on first place at the end of the day. So, um, you know, you probably have something to say about that. Uh, the teams that missed out on that second wave. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you really, yeah, and it's great. You mentioned that Yankees dynasty because from, from Jackie Robinson to Roger Maris, or, you know, actually even beyond, I think it was, they were in the world series 15 out of 18 years. So that kind of clouded things. They were just loaded. They didn't, you know, they would have been benefited by integration, but when you have Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, it didn't hurt him as much. But when you looked at the National League, it was the integrated teams who were having that kind of success. And over a 20 year span, it was the Dodgers, the Giants, um, you know, even then the Cubs um, a little bit, you know, with, with that as well. Uh, Cardinals, you know, they, they came along and they integrated, um, you know, in 54. So, you know, but then when the, when all those stars um, faded out with the Yankees and they were slow to integrate, you know, that that's when it affected them, the post, you know, after Mantle, after Maris um, and the Red Sox, you mentioned as well. Um, it was a dynamic brand of baseball. It was, it was not just integrating players. It was integrating styles, you know, that Jackie Robinson style we're all familiar with the hit and runs, the stolen bases, the stealing home that hadn't been prevalent in major league baseball since Ty Cobb. Um, you know, they went through the home run um, era, just like we're going through now where people didn't steal bases until Louis Aparicio came along um, and Jackie Robinson. So um, that, that was really important too. So those teams that didn't integrate, they got left behind in that style. They were playing a style of baseball that was 10, 15 years obsolete at the time. Um, you know, and, and I always, one of the things I had come across too um, was Pepper Martin talking about, we, we had mentioned barnstorming and, and the early barnstorming. Uh, and Pepper Martin was, was famous for, you know, running wild in, uh, I forget what World Series it is back, back in the, I think the 30s. Um, where he had, you know, a ton of stolen bases and bun hits and hit and runs. And, you know, he was the MVP. Um, and he came out and flat out said, I learned that style of play by barnstorming. Uh, watching those plays, I saw how tough it was to defend and how much pressure it put on. Um, so he was really one of the, the forefront to start bringing that uh, and adapting that style of play. So the teams that didn't, um, they missed out on it. And, and it hurt them uh, for a long time uh, with, with lack of success. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you really opened my eyes to the level and depth of, of black talent uh, when I was young in the in the 1960s. Uh, uh, you mentioned that, uh, what, nine of the first 13 NL rookies of the year were African-American. And uh, I attended the All-Star Game as a boy in 1965 oh. in Minnesota. And there were six of the eight starters in the National League lineup were black. And uh, you have a num number of those kind of illustrations that are just mind-bending. I just never realized how much they dominated the game at that time. Uh, um, that second wave really made a huge difference, didn't it? Yeah, it really did. It, it started to kind of you know, bring that flavor to the game. Uh, 
And, and again, it was it was tough to defend because that generation of, of of white players had never seen that that style of play. They didn't, you know, they didn't grow up with that in the minor leagues and everything. Um, and that was kind of what what I wanted to try to create as a visual. You know, you had the two contrasting styles, and it really kind of exploded into the seventies. You know, as the sixties blended then into the seventies. You know, you had the the crew cut. Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle, all American boy kind of thing. And, you know, nobody had facial hair at the time. Everybody's hair was, was trimmed short, um, you know, buttoned up and very businesslike. And then all of a sudden, you know, late sixties, early seventies, uh, Dick Allen was one of the first to come around, have some facial hair and, and, um, and some attitude. And, um, and, you know, then you saw that explosion with the, with the set, with the A's, uh, you know, Reggie Jackson and those guys, um, and you just look at where baseball was, you know, say just from that decade is say 66. And then you look at where it was and say 76. And it was, you know, it was a fun game. Yeah, you know, it was really that 70s was uh, was a wild time to be watching baseball. I love my Oscar Gamble baseball cards from the early 70s. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and that, that's what you didn't have. What's that? I was going to say that's what you didn't have in the in the '60s uh, or you know any time before. It wasn't that personality, and that was part of, of the reason for or one of the things I wanted to get across with my book too. It wasn't just you know the Hall of Famers of Bob Gibson and Reggie Jackson and and Hank Aaron. It wasn't just those guys. Um, everybody played a role as far as African Americans bringing the game to life. Oscar Gamble, Mickey Rivers, Mudcat Grant. You know, all, I mean, all these guys with these awesome personalities you know, all-star players, but uh, maybe not Hall of Famers, but just, man, they made it fun to watch. And, and that was really exciting. Yeah, Mike Grant was a wonderful personality. Doc Ellis, who can go on and on there. And you mentioned yeah. Reggie Jackson, and I, I never understood he had his role in the in the mustache gang uh, getting mm -hmm. started. You know, you kind of do a nice exploration of his personality and makeup, and that comes out of that story. I'd love to hear that story. So... Yeah, I, I, you know, I came across and, and a lot of um, my, the resources I tried to use were newspapers and, and periodicals from that time. Um, and also, you know, personal biographies so I can get firsthand accounts and um, from, from that way with guys that I couldn't interview. But anyway, it was, I mean, as the story went, um, you know, Dick Allen had really become the first person to wear facial hair. You know, he had the sideburns a little bit. Then, you um, you know, he was the first player to have a mustache since some some jokester had one in like the 1920s. I forget his name. Uh, and then who was going to tell Dick Allen? No. Right. Um, then Reggie showed up to spring training with the mustache and it was the same type of thing. He had, um, it, you know, it was between uh, Charlie Finley and the manager who was going to tell Reggie not to do it. And it was going to cause way more of a problem than uh to tell him not to do it. So what they kind of thought was, you know, all right, well, Reggie likes to be an individual. Um, let's, um, if everybody had a mustache and he's not an individual. So they started up the mustache gang. Uh, Charlie Finley was going to pay guys if they showed up with a mustache. And back then a few hundred bucks was uh, meant a lot to a player. So, you know, come opening day, you know, Raleigh fingers had his handlebar mustache and, uh, you know, Joe Rudy's out there and Gene Tennis and, you know, everybody's got the mustaches and um, and that kind of they got galvanized the A's behind it. So it was it was really cool how, you know, inadvertently Reggie kind of galvanized that team. And that really wasn't the intent of that whole thing. It was kind of, you know, well, sure, Reggie will probably shave his mustache if, if everybody else grows one. And that's just the individual he was. But. Uh, it's a funny story, and I may have missed some some details on it, but uh, it, it's it's great, and I you know made sure to include that in the book because that's that's part of the history there. Yeah, I had no idea Reggie kind of was the inspiration. So yeah, you know, and and for years and years and years, blacks have sort of faced this racist notion that they're not smart enough to quarterback an NFL club or call their own pitches. Mudcat Grant talked to me a little bit about that in the 50s. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of connected in Minnesota Twins through a couple of projects. And and you tell a story in the book that I was just completely unaware of. And that's a, a former Twins scout, Bob Thurman, uh, having a conversation with a very young Rudy May, who went on to have a 16-year career. And it probably is quite revealing about what a lot of Black players faced at that time. Please share with us that uh, uh, that experience, you know, the talk, the between the two of them 
Yeah, and, and Rudy May was fantastic to interview. Actually, I interviewed him for my first book, and he was so great with that that I, I called. He was the first, literally the very first guy I talked to uh, when I interviewed somebody for this this book. I was sitting in a hotel in Sacramento, still remember it. Um, and he told this great story where he was, you know, young and naive. He had grown up. Um, he was uh, friends with Joe Morgan. He grew up in in Oakland with Joe Morgan and. You know, California was a little bit more progressive, so he, you know, maybe was a little bit more naive about the way the rest of the country was. But anyway, you know, he gets drafted and um, and obviously back then, uh, you know, there's no Internet. There's no nothing like that. The, the twins just see the name Rudy May and they're trusting the scout. They don't know that he's an African-American pitcher. So basically, and then Rudy May never, never really understood um, Bob Thurman kind of put his career on the line with that by drafting him. Uh, and then Rudy May shows up and he's a black guy and nobody knew he was, that's what he was. Um, and Thurman had said to Rudy May, and I and then Rudy never realized it until years later, but, but Thurman said to Rudy May years later, they happened to cross paths in a hotel. Um, and he said, Hey, I'm just letting you know, nobody knew you were black. Uh, they would have, they would have fired me if I signed a black pitcher and he didn't work out. And he's like, Bob Thurman said, I thought you were so good. I figured once they saw you pitch, it didn't matter what color you were. And, and he was certainly right. Ru Rudy May went on to have, you know, very good minor league career and then, then great success, a great long major league career. Um, but it took people like that. And that, that was one of the, the people I wanted to try and include in the book. You know, a lot of smaller people along the way went out on a limb um, that way to try to help change those stereotypes and, and do, do things like that. Um, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, that was really interesting. And you brought up Rudy May too, another great story from that book. And you talk to people, you hear things like that, like I just said, or, or another story Rudy told me where when he was in the minor leagues, the white players, there was a water fountain in the dugout, nice cold water playing in the South. Um, you know, and only the white players could use the water fountain. Uh, for the African-American players, they had a bucket that sat behind the dugout um, with a ladle in it and they had to go ladle this warm water, you know, and that's it. And basically, you know, drink that. And you hear stories like that and it's just, it's fascinating. It sounds like they're from a entirely, entirely different era from way, you know, days gone by, but here's, you know, somebody that we watch pitch in our lifetime that dealt with, with that kind of stuff. And not that long ago, I mean, Rudy May only retired in the eighties. Uh, he's not somebody that played in the thirties or forties, you know, stuff like that. So really, really fascinating stuff. Well, and you write, uh, you write about the percentage of black players. I think the top year was sometime in the 70, 70s, seventies, but basically there was a steady growth and then the drop-off came in recent decades. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can share with listeners, the, you know, the rough statistics for the decades and what it meant and what happened in the recent decades. Yeah. The height, the height of it all was, was late seventies. Um, early 80s of African-American participation in Major League Baseball. It was about, it steadily grew from when, from full integration onto that, that time period. Um, you know, it stayed pretty steadily right around 16 to 20%. I think 18 and a half percent, 19% was the highest level it reached. Um, and it was stable all the way through the 80s, even the early part of the 90s. Um, you know, the percentage kind of leveled off there. It stopped growing, but it was healthy. Um, and honestly, it, it, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but from the 1994 strike until about five or six years ago, that percentage decreased slightly every single year. Uh, it was about a 25 year period where by 1% or a half a percent or an eighth of a percent, every year it went down until it was at about, um, I think the low point was five, five, four or five percent. Uh, participation among Major League Baseball uh, African Americans. Um, it's 2015 is where it kind of leveled off and started to tick up again. Um, it's right at about the seven to eight percent mark again. So that was, I think, good news um, that you know the the trend had stopped. Um, it had leveled off, and it's now starting to tick back up again. Uh, it'd be tough to ever get back to the way it was in the 70s and 80s, just mathematically. Um, at that point, Hispanic players only made up about 10 or 12% of Major League Baseball. Now they're closer to 30%. So um, 
You know, you look at the year 2000 as a good benchmark. I mean, trend, the trend in participation among African-Americans was on the way down, um, but it was at about uh, 12 or 13 percent at that point. And I don't think there's any reason why you can't get back up to be that high again. Um, Hispanics were about 28, 29 percent at that time, um, and the rest were made up of white players. Um, that, that I think that's a fair target. Uh, you know, the game's globalized now a lot more than it's been in the past, but I don't think there's any reason. And I think, you know, the trend's starting to move that way where it could, couldn't get it back up to about 12% or so. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems natural that people will gravitate to an environment in which they feel they belong. And mm -hmm. obviously African-American people haven't seen African-American players quite, quite in the same numbers, obviously, in recent decades. And, and you bring up another element that I hadn't thought about is, you know, the game's, you know, um, you know, velocity, uh, exit velocity, and, and mm. uh, you know, <laughs> angle of hitting, and uh, the little ball game has disappeared where blacks have excelled, the, you know, the base stealing and the hit and run, and, and that's part of not seeing, you know, people like you in the game, right. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely, without question, and that's, uh, you look at roster construction and the way the game's played, and it's not, you know, when we were watching baseball growing up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, you looked at the top fit 10 to 15, 20 base dealers in each league, and it's mostly African-American players um, with that, be, you know, and and the roster construction, too. Um, you know, the pitching staffs have taken up much more space on the roster. There's no room for guys like Herb Washington on the roster or, you know, defensive specialists, pinch slash pinch runners, um, you know, where you need a little bit of speed late in the game. Um, because there are so many pitchers now, there's no room on the roster for that. Um, so, you know, we talked about uh, percentage of uh, African-Americans when you start breaking it down by position. Catchers, it was the lowest percentage of participation with, followed by pitchers. So as those spots take up more and more roster spots, um, there's, there's lack of, you know, the African-Americans are the ones that are squeezed out. Um, and then likewise, too, I, I kind of, you know, the front office construction, we talk about, you know, exit velocity and analytics and all the uh, nonsense that you mentioned, in my opinion, um, you know, front offices now are consisting of Ivy League guys. Um, and, you know, when you look at the percentage of African Americans in the Ivy League, that's something they're working on, too. But that's, you know, less than 10 percent as well. So as as you know, guys like Kenny Williams um, with the White Sox, a former player, a baseball guy, as those guys are being phased out, those are less opportunities for African-Americans to, to be in the front office and to have a say in the way that baseball's run. Um, so I would just love it. How exciting would it be to get somebody like that? Someone, I mean, uh, Ken Griffey Jr. doesn't really need the aggravation of being a front office guy, but how great would it be if he came in here and said, hey, let's get a team together the way it used to be and, and, and get some speed guys and make it exciting and get some guys out in center field and in the outfield that can go chase it. Um, make some, you know, get some exciting guys in here that are going to hit and run. Um, I don't know. It's just, it, it's the way roster is constructed now, the way the game is played, the way that the front office is constructed is not, um, not making fertile ground for African-American success as players, managers, or uh, front office people. Yeah, the days of former players being GMs are gone. I Yeah, that's certainly part of it. And so we don't get that chance to have, you know, a Bob Gibson, or as you say, yeah. uh, Ken Griffey Jr. take one of those roles. And then you mm -hmm. take a step up, uh, you know, to the ownership level. And, you know, we've had numerous years of labor strife and MLB's, uh, you know, tendency has been not to promote their star players because they're going to make more money. This is something the NBA has done very successfully. And I think this is part of the equation too, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a huge part of the equation. And uh, I, I, that was a great conversation I had with, with Bob Kendrick again, to bring, bring him up. Um, he, he talked about when he was a kid in he grew up in Georgia and he watched Hank Aaron, you know, hit number seven fifteen. Uh, and he tells a story, and I've seen him tell it now on, on other podcasts and stuff, and I include it in my book. When he, he jumped off out of, uh, you know, off his couch when Hank hit the ball, um, 
and he rounded the bases in his living room. He, you know, went to the, the chair was first base and the TV was second base. And, you know, he rounded the bases with Hank Aaron. And, um, and you know, he said, I just wanted to run the bases with Hank. And, and that, you know, you multiply that across the entire country and how many African-Americans felt the same way uh, and how many people did that inspire to go play baseball or to really pursue baseball, fall in love with baseball. We all have those moments. Um, so, you know, that that's that's really important um, to have those people to see um, to see that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bob's story. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? I really yeah. love that story, too. Uh, you, you know, and then you get the other angle is what does it mean when as an amateur, you the amateur game hasn't been conducive, whether, you know, it's as a young player trying to establish yourself in the game or the or what happens at the college level. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, then once you become a prospect, what does it take to become a major leaguer? There's, there's lots of obstacles there and, and you do deal with them. Please tell us about that. Yeah. And that, that, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought up that question too. And that's another Bob Kendrick Pearl. That's what I said. It was the best experience I had with this book, but he's I'll steal his line. He said uh, with his credit, uh, we live in a microwave society. Um, and when you look at those, those stars, um, you go to a playground, if you went to a playground in, in the fifties, um, you know, yes, student, yes, kids, white or black, who they want to be like, you know, it's Willie Mays and, and Hank Aaron are listed and guys like that. Um, throughout the seventies, guys wanted, kids wanted to be Reggie Jackson. Uh, kids wanted to be Ken Griffey Jr. for, you know, when, when I was growing up, uh, and you, you look at those African-American kids in, in the, um, you know, in urban settings, and those were the people that they looked up to. Uh, now, if you go to a, a playground or a sandlot, the kids aren't playing baseball. You know, they're mostly playing basketball in, in the inner cities. Uh, if you start asking young African-American kids who their sports heroes are, it's, you know, it's Kobe, uh, it's Giannis, it's LeBron, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray. You go a long way before um, you get to Mookie Betts or, or people like that. Um, you know, young African-American baseball stars just aren't seen the way they were back, back in the day. Um, and that, that all goes back to the marketing that you talked about. I, who, who else is a better role model for black or white or anybody than Mookie Betts? Uh, you know, he, he should have been all over the place the way, you know, the way the NBA does, like, like what you said. Um, you know, Major League Baseball had a better marketing thing with that. Um, you know, it's not Mookie Betts' fault whatsoever. He goes out and plays and does dynamic. He's an incredible athlete, uh, smart guy, well-spoken, great with kids, great with the fans, uh, the complete package. Yeah, he should have been the face of Major League Baseball, um, you know, from the moment he, he came up and started excelling. And, you know, he, he hasn't had a couple of, you know, his past couple of years haven't been as good as, as the previous few so you don't know if that boat sailed, but, but I keep saying when people ask me, you know, I, I think somebody needs to come along like that, um, make a huge impact The Tiger Woods, what he did in golf, um, a LeBron James, you know, Michael Jordan in the eighties, somebody where just everybody's going to gravitate to that guy. Uh, Mookie Betts, you know, could have possibly been that guy. Um, and I just, I think that needs to come along in major league baseball and, um, and uh, I'm anxiously awaiting for it to happen. And you talk about kids not really playing the game. And it's unfortunate. When I was a kid, baseball was a cheap sport to play. But now if you're really good, you've got this whole system you have to penetrate. It's very expensive. And then if you're good enough to go on to college, um, you know, there's only so many scholarships. So it just seems to discourage you know, a lot of the population from even thinking about pursuing that that route. And then when you get there, of course, you go to the minors, you don't go right to the Orlando Magic or the, right. uh, you know, so that's another sad angle of it, too, unfortunately, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, and you're right. When we were we were growing up, all you needed was a wiffle ball and a bat, and then, you know, it's a couple dollars out of the store. You put four pizza boxes out there as bases, and and any open field was a baseball field, and and you drive around town, and and you could see games going on wherever. Um, now it's just a lot easier to play basketball. It's a lot less expensive. You know, baseball is all about the travel coaches and the personalized instruction and the year round stuff. And it's just, it's pricing out those who aren't socioeconomically advantaged. Um, you know, and that leads to a lot of the inner city exclusion um, and stuff like that. And, and baseball is doing a good job to try to rectify some of that, but 
you know, there, there's a lot of work to be done. It's such a multi-level thing. You mentioned college and scholarships. Um, it's you look at a football roster. There's, you know, 100 people out there. You know, 80 something scholarships. It's a lot easier. You know, a college can take a scholarship and use it on a, a project. A kid with extreme athleticism who might not have been taught the sport, but they could use a scholarship on somebody that's that's dynamic athletically and and help help them learn. In baseball, you can't do that on the college level. It's a limited amount of scholarships. You have to take the elite of the elite on the division one level. Um, and it's it's unfortunately, you know, excluding a lot of African American players. Mm -hmm. Now you address some of the efforts, you know, in, you know, underway right now to increase participation. And uh, what some of those, what of those efforts do you put the most faith in? What do you like what you see? Um, I do like what, what baseball is doing with the, the RBI program and the Urban Youth Academy. Um, that was started. It's been it's been a long time. It's been, I think, 25 years, uh, maybe even more since those programs really started. Um, and, and I had interviewed um, a couple former players and we kind of talked about that. Um, and if they they could do, you know, that's how a lot of the Latino players started in, coming into baseball. Um, there were those, the Dominican baseball academies and Puerto Rican baseball academies. Venezuela was big with that. And, you know, they literally would take kids off the sandlots who were using cardboard for gloves, put them into these academies and, and, and teach them and they would learn and grow. And then we saw the, the fruits of that, you know, throughout the 90s and, and 2000s as, um, you know, Hispanic participation um, blossomed. Um, so... You know, we have it. We're starting to see that in uh, with African Americans in Major League Baseball. I think, you know, the first five to ten years of those academies was more about getting things off the ground and just, you know, getting kids, you know, starting that grassroots effort. Um, now you're starting to see some of the higher level um, players come through those programs. You're starting to see first round draft picks um, come through those programs. Uh, you know, Major League All Stars come through those programs. So. You know, the next step, I think, is, you know, they have them in the major cities. They have them in L.A., Kansas City, the others, New York, New Jersey, um, is reaching some of those smaller pockets. The, the Not necessarily the big urban cities, but the smaller urban pockets. You know, there's one in, you know, there's an urban youth academy or RBI program in, in New York City. But, you know, I'm just using New Jersey as an example because that's where I'm from. There are plenty of smaller cities, you know, inner cities scattered throughout New Jersey where kids aren't going to be able to go take that 45 minute trip into New York City to do that. So it's just about, you know, further outreach, more resources um, and, and and just more inclusion. The more you include and the more opportunities you offer, um, the more participation there will be. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a last question. Um, you really share the stories of so many African-American players and their distinct accomplishments. It's a wonderful part of the book. I just learned an awful lot about some players I didn't know much about, you know, when they were playing. And uh, I'm curious whether you've developed some new favorites, a few guys that maybe you didn't know much about, but now you're very inspired by what you learned from them. And do you have a few, few favorites now that you didn't have before? Yeah, I, um, I you know, learning more about the, the, um, yeah, the Negro League guys, the guy I mentioned, Saul White earlier, um, was a guy I I've, I've wanted to look more into and, and understand. Um, you know, from throughout the 70s, I mentioned a twins guy, Earl Batty, you know, always, you know, heard his name and knew he was a good catcher, good all, you know, all-star guy. But, you know, people like that, I'd like to learn more about their story. Um, you know, and then even going back further, I, I really enjoyed the story. I, I really think this would make a great long, either longer article or, or, or something about um, about uh, Charlie Grant uh, and John McGraw, and they tried to pass Charlie Grant off as uh, a Native American uh, to the point where that you know it was this was before Jackie Robinson. Um, they wanted to you know they think John McGraw saw him playing, uh, and you know he was lighter skin, he had longer hair, straight hair, uh, African American, so he couldn't play. But he was pretty well known around the African American leagues because of how good he was. So John McGraw concocted this plan and said, like, okay, you're not Charlie Grant anymore. You're Charlie Takahoma. 
and you're an American Indian. And it, to me, it was fascinating because the newspapers covered it. And, you know, there's articles about the guy, Charlie Takahoma, and, you know, and, and they did a, a preview. He, McGraw was with the Orioles at the time, uh, you know, a preview of the Baltimore Orioles for the season. And they talked about this new mysterious player that John McGraw found. And, and you know, and he was out there. And, and, you know, I think what ended up, um, squashing it was was Roger Bresnahan, the, the Hall of Fame catcher, had known Charlie Grant from playing, you know, because Roger Bresnahan liked going to watch the African-Americans play. And he finally, you know, he said, wait a second, I know this guy. Um, you know, and then the whole thing kind of blew up. But it, it only, you know, it went on for a few weeks. Um, so I, I, it'd be really cool to, to dive into that story and, and, and find, try to find more stories like that, too. It's so bizarre looking back now. And then, and then there were all these distinctions made between Latinos who were light skinned and dark skinned when, you know, you know, in the sixties, particularly for me, I discovered, uh, you know, Camilo Pasquale was light skinned. So mm -hmm. he could go to, he could play minor league ball in Texas, but uh, Tony Oliva was dark skinned. So, you know, you just, yeah. And then you get distinctions where you're deciding someone's an American Indian to try to pass them off. It's, it was such a weird time. It was so strange, wasn't it? So, it was. And the guy like Dolph, Dolph Loke too, um, the pitcher, uh, same thing. He was, it was wild to see, and I, I wish I, I knew the resource off the top of my head, but it was uh, in some newspaper article. Basically, they said, okay, well, you know, we'll allow Dolph Loke to pitch in the major leagues, but anybody darker than him, forget about it. They, like, drew the line at, at him, and they would actually use people to, like, like that as a, as a barometer. So if you were, you know, lighter skin than, than Dolph Loke, you were okay. If you were darker skin, not so much. Um, it's just insane to, to, to think of, you know, how, how people were treated that way. Yeah. Well, this has been terrific. It's time to close another edition of the many pandemic baseball book club author chats. Uh, we've been with Rocky Constantino, Rocco Constantino, excuse me. Um, the book is out. Here it is. Uh, it's wonderful. Beyond baseball's color barrier. Uh, you can find these chats at the uh, uh, Pandemic Baseball uh, Book Club website. That's pbbclub.com, pbbclub.com. So uh, thank you, Rocco, for your insights. It's been terrific today. Uh, hope to see you all again. Join another chat down the road and look for this book.